Welcome. We are live here for the Penal Museum and Society, Geology and Mineral Societies. Uh, we are live and I'm getting set up here. Jeff Scoville will join us in a minute. I wanted to say hello and make sure, let's see where, uh, make sure you knew that on March 12th, 2022, just a month away from today, uh, 10 to 3, we will have our meteorites and dinosaurs, touchables, vendors, fossil dig, kids' activities, all sorts of things, special guests, and just some lots of fun. It's our usual annual show back again. Uh, we are uh, getting started. We're also open 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday, at least until May. We'll let you know after that. Uh, uh, also let you know that please add your comments, add your questions to the comments on YouTube. Jeff will take those at the end. And uh, unless there's something super urgent where I will interrupt him. But until then, I'm going to uh, say hello to... Uh, Jeff Scoville, there he is. There I am. Um, <clears throat> Jeff is a, a mineral photographer, a general photographer, but specializing in minerals, and has been doing so for a couple of decades at least. And he is one of the world premier mineral, if not the world premier, uh, mineral photographers. And we are very, very happy and honored to have him with us. Uh, he's just come back from Tucson, of course, to his home, and uh, we have been uh, lucky enough to snag him while well, he's still got jet lag from driving from Phoenix to Tucson and back. <laughs> uh, I'll let Jeff introduce himself any more that he, than he wants, and until then, I will let's see where the, there I'll go. Um, I will take myself off the screen. I will bring the slideshow up. There we go. That's the tonight's talk. And um, Jeff, do you have anything you want to ask me before we get started? Or Not really, but uh, I would hope someday I'm going to get down to your neck of the woods and visit the, 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 uh, the museum that um, Ray has been <clears throat> pushing and talking about for several years now. Yep. Uh, if I ever find a you know a few minutes to spare that I can get down there, it'd be great. It's uh, it's a it's a great little museum. I really enjoy it. Uh, being part of it. Okay, so uh, take it away, Jeff. I'm going to disappear from the screen and there I am. Whoops, that was not what I went to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to disappear from the screen. There we are, uh, and uh, let you go on it. All righty. Say next when you're ready. All right. Well, just a, a, a little note here by way of introduction. Um, people often ask me how I got involved in this uh, strange business. And uh, my father was a geologist, though he didn't stick with it very long. But with a weird hammer he had with a pointy end on it and, and uh, one of those boxes that had all the little rocks samples glued down little rows in it somehow that caught my attention as a young kid and i started collecting minerals when i was about eight years old and uh <clears throat> of course the initial you know what i bought uh, collected initially was just literally pretty rocks and i didn't know beans about crystals or anything else but i soon uh, learned that there was something really cool called crystals and <clears throat> i actually <clears throat> when i was a kid I actually created a museum in the basement of my home back in Connecticut, where I grew up. Uh, I was actually born in Denver, but moved to Connecticut when I was six. And since when you're six, you haven't really got much of a say in where your parents decide to move to. But uh, I grew up in Connecticut, where there actually was a lot of mineral collecting. And uh, anyway, it just grew and grew and grew. And uh, uh, my father gave me my first camera when I graduated high school. That's class of 70, so do the math. And uh, it just went with me everywhere. I became 
photo man or cameraman, I think is what they called me in college. Anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it became a passion, just photographing a little bit of everything. I immediately gravitated towards shooting uh, small things. And uh, I was uh, I actually started off as, as an earth science major, but switched to anthropology and archaeology and uh, worked on a dig in New Mexico for seven field seasons, uh, driving back and forth initially, and then eventually moving out to Arizona, uh, to Phoenix to become, uh, to go to graduate school at Arizona State University, where I was an anthropology major specializing in Southwest archaeology and museum work. Anyway. I was doing that for several years working on the dig and I was given the job as photographer in the lab. And so I essentially uh, self-taught myself uh, scientific photography. And after three years, I decided, oh, let me, let me try this on minerals. And I started shooting minerals. So that's back in 75. Um, I must say the results were fairly abysmal, but uh, you know, practice makes perfect. And I just kept at it as a, as a hobby. And for 15 years, I played with it as a hobby. I did photography for uh, local uh, geologists, people writing articles for uh, Rocks and Minerals magazine, Mineralogical Record, whatnot, and uh, published a number of articles of my own on both mineralogy and um, on the uh, subject of photography of minerals. And then after 15 years, I decided to turn it into a business. It seems like kind of a strange thing to do to make a business photographing minerals. I mean, can you actually make a living at that? Well, 32 years later, I'm still doing it. And I've become, I guess you have to say, world renowned for my work. And I travel all over the United States and Europe and actually a number of other countries. I've been to China five times, Australia twice, Brazil twice, Israel, practically every country in Europe. And, uh, <clears throat> taking photographs for mineral collectors, dealers, um, museum curators, and uh, really enjoying it. So what I'm going to show you tonight is just a little overview of a typical life, a uh, year in the life of a mineral photographer. Next. So uh, this particular year, by the way, we're going back a little bit. This is the year 2015. And uh, <clears throat> it is fairly typical of a year for me, and at least up until two years ago in COVID, uh, where I uh, travel all over the place. So uh, I do have a studio uh, in my backyard of my home in Phoenix. And uh, people bring me things there. They send me things there. And um, so this is a really nice pendant of tanzanite, moonstone, sapphire, and gold that I photographed for uh, Paul Farmer of uh, uh, Beausoleil Jewelers. And uh, anyway, this was shot in my studio. Next. Another piece, this is uh, this fellow is a Native American, and he occasionally, very occasionally, has me shoot something for him. So this is Coral, set in gold by Emery Omsete. Next. And then my first trip of the year, actually, in January of, that, of 2015, I took a trip to Southern California, where I have a number of clients. And uh, some of you may have he heard of a very well-known collector dealer by the name of Bill Larson. And um, Bill has quite a fine collection in his fine home. And I spent several days photographing for him. So this is a beautiful wolfenite specimen from the Sumeb mine in Namibia. It's 6.3 centimeters high. And by the way, I do all my measurements in metric. And... <clears throat> Excuse me. For those of you who are metrically challenged, there are 2.54 centimeters per inch. So about two and a half centimeters. So this guy at 6.3 centimeters here is about two and a half inches high. Uh, next. And for those of you who uh, have questions about how the heck does he take those pictures? Why? What are they sitting on? We can discuss that a little bit later on, maybe question and answer period, or I can squeeze in a few um, <clears throat> uh, notes on, on my technique as we're going along. Anyway, this is copper, uh, from Michigan. Uh, unfortunately no more precise location than that. Anyway, also from the Larson collection, it's just under two inches across 4.8 centimeters. And, uh, uh, next. 
Most of the time I photograph on a sheet of horizontal glass that's held up uh, in a framework, basically like kind of a glass topped end table by your sofa. And, uh, but the glass is picture framing, non-glare picture framing glass. And um, anyway, with, with uh, opposite the camera and hanging down from the far side is a sheet in this case of black paper. And uh, uh, on the far side, kind of opposite the camera, above the glass, I have a couple sheets of uh, basically tissue paper that act as a diffuser. And on its far side, opposite the camera is a light and it shines through the tissue paper and that hot spot in the tissue paper reflects off the glass and creates this nice neutral halo. In the previous shot of the, the copper, basically it was the same setup, but instead of a neutral background, I decided to give it a little life and I put a blue gel over that light that was behind the tissue paper and then I get a blue uh, halo reflection off the glass. Next. So, um, if we could go back just one, thank you. Uh, this is Spinel from Sri Lanka. And a uh, little guy at 1.8 centimeters high. Some of you may know that in photography, as you get closer to a subject, the smudge subject gets smaller, you start to lose depth of field or what is all what all is in focus. And so there is a technique now that's called stacking, focus stacking specifically, that allows you to get a crystal completely in focus front to back. And that's what I do with uh, with all small subjects, basically miniature size, two inches and down, sometimes even with larger ones. I won't go into what focus, focus stacking is, but uh, just uh, understand that's what I used on this particular shot. Next. So uh, still in the Bill Larson collection, this is a rhodochrosite. Uh, from the sunny side of mine down near Silverton, Colorado, in the southwest part of the state. It's nine centimeters across. Um, next. And this is a pretty cool piece. No, it was not fake. That's just how it was found. Several have been found like this from this locality. It's the Spruce Claim up in King County, Washington. It produces beautiful uh, milky quartz crystals, sometimes sceptered, and often with pyrites. And the pyrites can be perched on top of a nice crystal like this, kind of like a, a, a cubic Tootsie Roll pop. Beautiful thing. Nine centimeters high, still in the Larson collection. Next. Um, also in the Larson collection, this is Beryl variety Heliodor. That's the yellow variety uh, from the Greek Helios, meaning the sun. This is from uh, Teofilo Otoni in Minas Gerais, Brazil. 8.4 centimeters across. Next. Well, a little ways west of, um, of um, Fallbrook, California, is a town called Bonsal. And there live uh, Gloria and uh, um, Don Olson. And uh, this is, uh, I spent a, a day shooting for them. This is malachite from the coal shaft right here in Bisbee, Arizona. Six centimeters high. Next. Um after a day shooting for them, I headed north to, a, if I recall correctly, Pacific Palisades, where there's a collector by the name of Robert Hesselgesser. And uh, he particularly is fond of copper minerals from the Upper Peninsula, uh, copper and copper minerals. And uh, this is in the White Pine Mine in Ontonagon County. It's only two centimeters high. And yes, this was also a stack shot to get it all in focus. Next. Also in the Hessel -Gesser, Gesser collection, say that 10 times fast, uh, is this nice botryoidal group of goethe from Santiolalia in Chihuahua, Mexico, 9.5 centimeters wide. And this is another one where I had the neutral halo, but I threw a blue gel over uh, the, the light that produces the halo to create the, uh, the nice blue halo there. Otherwise, it would have been just a black and white picture, which may have been fine too, but I thought this looked a little nicer. Next, uh, same collection. This is copper from the Rubtsovskoye uh, mine in the Altai Mountains in Russia, 12 centimeters across, which means it's uh, about um, four and five eighths inches across. Next. So uh, a little out of my way, I headed back southwest again to Laguna Beach, California. And some of you have uh, maybe heard of Wayne and Donna Leicht, or Leicht, however you want to pronounce it. In German, it's Leicht. Um, 
and they live in Laguna Beach and their house is up on the hillside with a beautiful view of the ocean. And uh, they're mineral dealers, their business is called Cristali and they have a nice shop down there. And one of their specialties is gold. But anyway, so this is the view of uh, from their home. It's a lovely place to, uh, to go and photograph. Next. And uh, sometimes you get beautiful sunsets over coming in over the Pacific Ocean. I believe that's that might be Catalina, Catalina Island out there. I'm not sure. Anyway, next. So this is a, a gypsum of a ram's horn variety from Bo Becker in Tuisit, Morocco. At 13.6 centimeters, that's about five and a half inches high. Next. This is, all, this is silver, and this is from the Dukat mine in the Kolyma River Basin in Magadanskaya Oblast, Russia. Um, beautiful wire silver, 7.8 centimeters wide, which means it's just a hair over three inches. Why? Excuse me. Next. Another silver, but on the other side of the world, this is from the Veda Grande claim in Zacatecas, Mexico, 8.5 centimeters high. Next. And here's a calcite a twin from the Big Rig Mine in Egremont, Cumbria, England. This locality is famous for producing these twins that kind of look like, a, well, it could almost be a heart. Sometimes they do look like a heart. Anyway, uh, as you'll notice, I almost never put a scale in the picture. But in this one here, I took one with and without my hand. And besides providing scale, it also uh, showed the transparency since you can see my fingers right through the right side of that crystal. At 11.7 .7 centimeters wide, that's about four and a half inches. Next. And uh, head to do a shot. This is in uh, Wayne's office downstairs in that house you saw the beautiful view from earlier. And he also has some very fine collectibles, such as this uh, blowpipe set on the right and uh, scales and whatnot. And uh, this is a sort of ad that he's been using for years and years, but uh, taken by uh, um, Harold Narek of Van Peltz who were the premier collect, uh, photographers of minerals and gems for many years, uh, as well as jewelry. Uh, they are now retired. But uh, anyway, we just uh, decided to play around and see if we could do something comparable. Next. Now, uh, if I recall correctly, I headed home after that trip. And uh, so we're, we're, we're or maybe this is, uh, this might be Tucson, actually. Yeah, come to think of it, late June, uh, excuse me, late January every year around the 28th, I head down to Tucson and spent two and a half weeks or so photographing for people who come to the show. And uh, Wayne Sorensen is a well-known collector of cabinet-sized specimens from Idaho. And he brought uh, this beautiful rhodochrosite from the Sweet Home Mine in Alma, Colorado, 13 centimeters wide. So that's uh, about five and a quarter inches across. Next. Also, while I was there, Mark Miterman, who is partners, business partners with um, Evan Jones, uh, brought this wonderful stalactitic, or in this case, maybe stalagmitic um, malachite from the Star of Congo mine in Katanga, Democratic Republic of Congo. 15.3 centimeters high, so that's just over six inches. Next. Small sceptered Elba I tourmaline from uh, Barra do Salinas in Minas Gerais, Brazil. Also from Mark's collection, 7.3 centimeters high. Next. Now, I don't only photograph minerals. I photograph gems, jewelry. You already saw some of the jewelry. And um, anything really kind of collectible and uh, fairly high end or whatever someone's willing, me to, uh, willing to pay me to shoot. So uh, Wayne Thompson, some of you may know of. He's a well-known uh, mineral dealer, very high quality, and he has uh, <clears throat> um, also had a great passion for prehistoric Native American pottery and basketry. This is part of his collection. It's a tray, an Apache tray from Arizona, 23 and three quarter inches in diameter. Uh, he just last this past year published a book on a high end um, Native American basketry, which had a Hundreds of my photographs in it. Next. So back to Mr. Farmer, Paul Farmer of Beausolier. This is a nice ring with an uh, indicoli tourmaline in it set in gold. 1.35 carats on the stone from Minas Gerais, Brazil. Next. 
Another local collector is Tony Ponacek. And uh, Tony did some collecting a number of years ago up in the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho. Uh, this is, uh, they're pigmatites up there with beautiful smoky quartzes. And primarily what people are after are the aquamarine crystals. So <clears throat> 3.2 centimeters high. Next. Um, anyway, at the show, there was a, a dealer um, who um, had uh, worked many, many years ago at a mine in uh, Zambia. And uh, hardly anybody knew about this locality, but it did produce some nice copper minerals and even some uranium minerals, such as this metatorbernite. This is from the Enchanga Open Pit in Chingola, Zambia. 2.4 centimeters wide, so it's just under an inch. It is now in the collection of Alex Schaus. Next. Um, really neat specimen here. This is Ahoite in quartz from the Messina mine in Limpopo province, uh, Republic of South Africa, nine centimeters wide. I photographed this at the Tucson show for Patrick Meyer, who lives uh, in Zanzibar and specializes in minerals of Southern Africa. And interesting here, um, the quartz crystals from this mine either have this, excuse me, light kind of bluish green inclusions of Aho in it or Ahoite or dark blue Papagoa, Papagoite, uh, make beautiful specimens. And the interesting thing is that they were both named after uh, type localities and places in Arizona. Ahoite after, of course, Aho, Arizona, and Papagoite after the Native American tribe, uh, the Papago tribe. Next. Uh, it's a Canadian couple that come down and uh, to the show usually, uh, McCloskey Lapidary, and they have me photograph some of their interesting pieces. So this is Amitrine from the Anahi Mine in Sandoval Province, Bolivia, 222.2 carats. Fun piece to photograph and uh, to get all the details to come out of it and show the wonderful, wonderful uh, coloring and uh, the cut. Next. So also at the show, John White, uh, some of you may know of him. He is the retired curator of gems and minerals at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and a collector, of course. This is Brochantite from the now famous Milpias mine in Cuitaca, Sonora, Mexico. It's 5.4 centimeters wide. This locality started producing about 15 years ago. And uh, after it was uh, opened, it came up with some of the most amazing azurite crystals that the world has seen rivaling even the, the amazing ones from uh, Tsumeb and uh, uh, other localities. Anyway, it's produced probably the finest brochantite in the world, as you can see here. It's a group of uh, very nicely terminated crystals. Next. So um, for the Collector's Edge, they are major, major high-end dealers up in Golden, Colorado. I've been photographing for them for something like close to 30 years. And uh, this is Dioptes on quartz from Kalkavelt in the Kunani region of Namibia. And uh, 11 centimeters across uh, this locality. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Dioptes from Sumeb, Namibia. Well, this is a locality uh, not too far from Sumeb and uh, recently has been producing amazing smoky quartz crystals, but primarily Dioptes and Planchiite. Next. Gemstones. I said I photographed gemstones. So here's a little example. Uh, left to right, spinel. Uh, well, not right. Front row, spinel, chrysoberyl, tourmaline, and sovereite. Sovereite is a type of uh, green garnet from Africa. These are all African gemstones. It's photographed for a, a group of um, French speaking. Well, actually, one of them is French, one is uh, uh, French speaking Swiss, and one of them is French speaking Canadian. Anyway, so noble and brill. Uh, the largest stone there is 19.46 carats. Next. And keeping in mind, this is all shot at the show. Uh, this was an interesting piece, a little bit of a story behind it. There's a woman by the name of Paula Crebache, and she's known as, I think, the queen of color in the business. And she does amazing jewelry with multicolored gemstones. And um, this was on display along with a lot of sapphires, emphasizing or, or um, uh, showing off sapphires exclusively from Montana. So every one of those sapphires in different colors is from Montana. And they were on display from the Smithsonian at the main show. And I had to go oh, at closing, uh, 
along with uh, Robert Kane, a gemologist from Montana. And we took this out of a display case along with a whole bunch of stones, brought it back to my studio. And we were up until three o'clock at night photographing these things and then getting them back at three so that the guards can get them back in their cases and safe and uh, have them ready for the following morning and the show open. Anyway, 8.5 centimeters across and uh, gold and Montana sapphires. Next. And uh, these are the, the loose sapphires. This is how they come out of the river gravels, weathered out of their, uh, their original parent rocks up there in Montana. The largest of those is only 1.2 centimeters, so just a hair under half an inch. Smithsonian Institute collection. Next. Um, I think I get back from the show and there's a local fellow who um, has been working with some of the, the native Inuit in um, Greenland. And there they have been mining some interesting gemstones. This is a famous mineral called Tugtapite. And uh, the pair of matching earrings on the right are kind of stylized ulus. An ulu is a what's known as a woman's knife among the Inuit or what they used to be called uh, um, Eskimos. Anyway, interesting material. It's generally not terribly uh, flawless, but they have been faceting a few pieces, such as you see uh, the, the one facet stone there by the earrings. And by the white, the white T-top on those earrings is made from caribou antler. Next. Uh, one of the interesting projects I got to photograph, oh, this, no, this was still the Tucson, was this skull. It's carved out of a single piece of meteorite, uh, the famous Gibeon meteorite from Namibia. It is life-size, certainly not in the picture, but in life, if you held this, it weighs over 50 pounds. And it is very precisely anatomically correct. Um, it's not some one of these cheap things you can buy out of Brazil or China or uh, Peru. It's very, very accurate and detailed. Quite an interesting thing to photograph. Next. Also at the show, this is a, uh, this is a Celestine from the Holloway Quarry in Newport, Michigan, from the Harris Preck collection, 12.3 centimeters high. Harris is a collector who lives in Southeast Indiana. Next. Ah, definitely. I got back from Tucson. So these were a pair of wedding rings. They're made out of tungsten and inlaid with meteorite, probably Gibeon meteorite from Namibia, just like the skull. Anyway, this is from Men's Tungsten Online. I photographed this for, uh, for them probably late in February that year. Next. Another local collector is a fellow by the name of John Lucking, very fine collection. And this is a uh, silver, native silver, in a rather interesting formation. It comes from the famous locality of Kongsberg, Norway, 6.3 centimeters across. That's about two and a half inches. And uh, wires from this locality are quite common. But to have this kind of a strange wire cauliflower shape is, is uh, rather unique. Next. Well, I headed back to Southern California later in February. Maybe it's early March. Don't recall. But anyway after Tucson. And uh, there's a couple of in Fallbrook by the name of Carol, Cal and Kareth Graber. Kareth specializes in only the minerals of Mexico. This is a beautiful agrandite from the Ojuela mine in Mapame, Durango, Mexico. Little guy at 1.8 centimeters high. Next. Uh, not far from, um, further south in, in uh, San Diego is a collector by the name of Irv Brown high-end, very fine quality minerals. He also does uh, mineral dealing. Anyway, I think he brought a few, a few, yeah, excuse me, a few pieces to photograph while I was in the neighborhood. And this is a beautiful fluorite group from the Yaogan mine in Hunan, China, nine centimeters high. So about three and three quarter inches, three and five A's. Um, headed north from there to Berkeley, California and uh, to the home of Dr. Stephen Smale. Steve Smale is probably one of the top, if not the top mathematician in the world, won every award possible. And if there was a Nobel Prize for it, he would have won that too. Anyway, has a very fine collection. This is a Stibnite from the Wuling mine, Jiangxi, China, 26.1 centimeters high. So that makes it uh, just about 10 inches. Next. <clears throat> Uh, same collection. This is barite from the Meikle Mine in Elko County, Nevada, 
7.1 centimeters high. Next. And a cubanite. Cubanite's a fairly rare mineral. This is from the Henderson number mine, number one mine in Chibougamou, Quebec, Canada. 5.7 centimeters high. Next. Uh, famous locality is uh, Mount Zhubaoding in Sichuan, China. And uh, it's, it's a mountain with must be Swiss cheese by now. It produces probably the world's finest cassiterites. And you see that peeking out on the right edge there. And very strange tabular aquamarine um, barrel, such as the main crystal right here with muscovite. You often find them with uh, apatite crystals and some, and probably the world's finest shelite crystals too. Interesting locality. A few other weird rare minerals there uh, can be found there too. Next. This is a very fine, another barrel, but in the, when it's a pink, pink to peachy color, they call it morganite. This is with smoky quartz and albite feldspar, and this is from Kunar province in Afghanistan, 12 centimeters across. Next. Um, not far away, just to the north, I believe, if I recall correctly, San Rafael is a, a collector by the name of John Sigerman. Both he and his son collect primarily miniatures to uh, thumbnails. This is shigaite, a fairly uncommon mineral with rhodochrosite from the Enchuaning Tomb Mine in North Cape Province, South Africa, 3.1 centimeters across. Next. Okay, passed over uh, the mountains there, the Sierra Nevada, and past the famous Donner Pass, and uh, into Reno. Um, Scott Worski is a mineral collector dealer there, and uh, he ha his business is called Miner's Lunchbox, and I spent a couple days photographing for him uh, in this room right here. Luckily, uh, there was no clients. We were able to turn off all the lights and spend a couple of days photographing beautiful, beautiful minerals. Next. This is gold from Round Mountain, Nevada, and uh, 8.3 centimeters high. Next. Um, after a, a day or two with uh, Scott, I went over to the home of Neil and Cami Pren. They specialize uh, primarily in quartz. This is a beautiful Japan Law Twin Quartz from Iyanasana Quarry in Etremu, Madagascar, 9.5 centimeters high. Next. Um, now I can remember, I think, well, anyway, this, some of you may have heard of a well-known collector by the name of Keith Proctor from Colorado Springs. And uh, this is another gold from Round Mountain, uh, Nye County, Nevada. That's 6.7 centimeters across. So it's about, you know, two and three quarter inches. Um, trying to remember whether I actually went to his house to shoot this or whether I did this elsewhere. Uh, we'll find out in a moment. Next. Um, anyway, I took a trip. Um, mineralogical record, which I'm sure some of you have heard about, the top magazine in the United States on mineralogy. Uh, they do supplements every year or so on uh, regional you know, collectors from a particular region. And uh, in this case, it was going to be the Midwest. So I drove up to Minneapolis and did some shooting for Deborah Roman. And uh, this is uh, her collection room. Interestingly enough, the cabinets on the right are filled with beetles. Her husband is a entomologist, at least a, a, a an amateur one, but of high standing, who specializes in beetles or coleoptera. So left side is all minerals, right side's all bugs. Anyway, next. So from Deborah's collection, this is a beautiful morganine from uh, Pech, Kunar province, Afghanistan, 9.7 centimeters across. Next. And uh, from there, after spending a day, I headed down to Cincinnati, where I spent a, a day or so photographing for Terry Heising. Terry is a husband and editor for Rocks and Minerals magazine. His wife, uh, Marie, is the editor of the magazine. And he's a collector specializing in just calcite, or mostly calcite. Anyway, this calcite with amethyst from the La Delicia mine in Artigas, Uruguay, and 17.3 centimeters high, so that's not quite seven inches. Next. 
Um, Terry was one of the people who discovered the locality for Millerite and Honosite on the US 27 road cut in Halls Gap, Kentucky, 2.5 centimeters high. They occur in cute little um, geodes. Next. Well, from there, I headed west again, but not too far, just to uh, southwest of um, St. Louis and the home of uh, um, Dan and Diana Weinrich. And uh, he's a mineral dealer and collector, too. This is calcite from the Sweetwater Mine in Reynolds County, Missouri, 19.7 centimeters wide, so not quite eight inches across. Next. Uh, Galena from the Buick Mine in Reynolds, Reynolds County, Missouri, 31 centimeters high. So that is over uh, 12 and a quarter inches. Um, the Buick mine is famous for producing these really bizarre, elongated, strange uh, galenas and pyrites. Next. Uh, while their collector by the name of Joel Perlmutter, per Perlmutter uh, came by and he collects garnet and he particularly likes rough and cuts. So this is Spessartine Garnet with Shoral Tourmaline and Albite from the Little Three Mine in Ramona, California. 4.7 centimeters high in the specimen and 5.20 carats on the stone. Next. Well, jogging back northeast to get to, to well, uh, northeast from uh, St. Louis anyway. I'm in northwest Ohio and the collection of Jeffrey Whaley. And he likes big rocks, big, big cabinet specimens. And this is one of his smaller ones at about eight and a half inches. Fluorite with Galena from the Hill Ledford Mine in Illinois. Next. Then uh, heading over towards uh, Cleveland, Ohio, is uh, we have the collection of Mike Marino. This is a malachite pseudomorph after azurite from the Campbell shaft in Bisbee, 5.8 centimeters high. Next. In the same collection, this is fluorite with dolomite from the Elmwood mine in Tennessee, 10.9 centimeters across. So that's a little over four, four and a third inches. Next. Um, this is albite tourmaline from the Havy mine in Poland, Maine, three centimeters high on the stone from Jeffrey Morrison, who is actually mining this locality in Maine. Um, trying to think. Oh, I might have shot, I think I shot this at the Cincinnati show. Next. And uh, also in the, the uh, Cleveland area is a collector by the name of Jim Gable. He's a doctor. And uh, he specializes primarily in fluorite and the minerals of Southern Illinois. This fluorite with barite, the white material is barite from the Minerva Number no. 1 mine in Hardin County, Illinois, 8.8 .8 centimeters wide. Next. Well, I got back to Phoenix and a fellow by the name of Bruce Bridges uh, brought me these to shoot. His father was the discoverer of what became known as a scorpion mine in Taita, Kenya. And uh, they mine a green grossular garnet there, which the gem variety is known as Sovereite. So the largest stone there in the far left is 25.01 carats. Next. Okay, late, uh, usually around June 1st or so, I head for Europe and uh, spend usually six weeks there. And I, three, four years in a row, I spent a month. Actually, this is early May, come to think of it. I would leave for Europe a month earlier than usual and spent one whole month photographing in Tübingen, Germany for <clears throat> a collector by the name of Gregor Markel. And uh, in town, this is the old castle, which is known as uh, uh, Castle Hohe Tübingen, which just means High Tübingen. <coughs> Wonderful place to go poking around. It is now a museum, an art museum, and an archaeology museum. Beautiful place. Wonderful little town. It has a university there where he is a uh, geology, mineralogy professor. Next. So this is uh, part of the sculpture gallery inside the castle. Next. A view from the castle looking down on the uh, Neckar River. Next. And down at the river, kind of their answer to the gondolas of Venice. You can uh, pay them a, a, a few euros and you get to go up and down the river a little ways. And uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful area. Next. 
Uh, they have a, uh, a great church in, in the middle of town, and uh, this is part of the crypt. With uh, These are carved, life-size stone representations of a, a, the, the people who are inside those, uh, those crypts, or sarcophagi, if you want to call them that. Next. Just outside of Jubingen is a small town called Babenhausen, which holds a monastery and a beautiful church. Next. Next. It is now a museum, and uh, part of it was taken over by some local royalty and used as a hunting lodge for a number of years. Next. <clears throat> and the quarters that they lived in are still preserved just as they lived in them. These are not reproductions or replacements. Next. This is Professor Gregor Markel. It's standing in his mineral collection room. Next. And just to give you an idea what his collection is like, he specializes primarily in the minerals of the Black Forest. And a few years ago, using the photographs I took for him, he published a four volume set of large books, we could almost call them doorstops, on the minerals of the Black Forest. Uh, the only other thing he collects are pyromorphites, and they don't have to be from the Black Forest. Next. This is a silver, dendritic silver, from the Tiefengraben Quarry in Reinertsau, Germany, 4.6 centimeters wide. Next. And here he is uh, just standing outside with one of the beautiful fluorites from the Hesselbach mine in Oberkirch in uh, Black Forest. Uh, you get an idea of the uh, the size of the piece. And considering the fact that he's about six foot three, uh, that's those are big hands and that's, uh, that's a big fluorite specimen. Next. And he's got micros. These are micro cerusites from the Herrensägen mine in Wildschabach. Uh, the largest crystal cluster there is 0.8 centimeters. So maybe a third of an inch. Next. Some beautiful dark blue fluorites from uh, the Hesselbach mine, 11.2 centimeters high. Most people think of beautiful blue fluorites as coming from the Minerva mine and maybe central France, but there are gorgeous fluorites also from uh, Germany. Next. One weekend I took off with uh, Dr. Guanghua Liu, who is a professor of geology and a mineral dealer and a professional geologist from Beijing, but he has a home also in Tübingen. And so he and I took off to visit uh, this castle called Burg Hohenzollern in Bissingen, not very far away from Tübingen. Wonderful, wonderful castle, beautifully restored and a uh, great place to visit. Next. Anyway, traveling from Germany, I went a little bit northwest to Luxembourg, and there is the National Museum of Natural History. And I spent a couple of days there photographing. Next. Uh, through the middle of town is this beautiful little river. Uh, Luxembourg is a beautiful, the, the city of Luxembourg is the capital of the country of Luxembourg. Very small country, but uh, beautiful and very scenic. Next. These are some metatorbernites in the museum's collection from Redruth, Cornwall, England. The largest crystal there is only 0.3 centimeters. So you're talking about maybe a little, you know, an eighth of an inch or so. Next. This is, uh, again, got to have to stick my hand in the picture there. Um, Japan Law Twin Quartz from the Crystal Mine in Brazil, I think in Minas Gerais. 29.1 centimeters wide, so not quite a foot across. Next. Anyway, back to Germany. Over near Mainz lives a collector dealer by the name of Roger Lang. Well, he pronounced it Roger as if he was French, but he's not. His profession is designing and making uh, exhibits for uh, museums. So this was a part of an exhibit that he put in in this museum in Mainz. Next. He actually lives in Gau Algesheim, and here we were. We stopped for a little dinner and a snack in the town square. Next. And I spent a day photographing his collection. These are elbite tourmalines with lapidolite from the Petaniera mine in Minas Gerais, Brazil, 9.7 centimeters high. Next. Well, from there, I headed to the famous St. Marie show 
It's held um, in uh, saint marie aux in Alsace, eastern France, not too far from the German border, a little ways west of Strasbourg. And uh, this is a little mining town. And they have the second largest mineral show in Europe every year. It's a fantastic show. I generally go most years. This is the theater. In the basement of the theater is where I have a little setup to do photography. And in the main portion of the theater, they have some of the higher end dealers. And I don't know how many square blocks are cordoned off and full of tents such as you see here with mineral gem fossil uh, dealers from all over the world. Next. Uh, part of the special exhibits that they put up. Next. And some more. This, I believe, the specialty was uh, minerals of the Alps. Next. So these are my lovely ritzy quarters for doing photography. Uh, it's a little damp. It's dingy. It's grungy. But it is uh, relatively dark. And the nice thing is when it's hotter in the hubs of Hades in uh, in the city, when when it, where it can be in June and last weekend of June, it is the coolest place in town. And if it's raining cats and dogs, it's the driest place in town. So I can't complain too much about the accommodations. Anyway, I shoot on the table on the left. The table on the right is uh, 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 the publisher of the French mineral magazine, La Reine Mineral. Louis Dominique Bale, he sets up and photographs there for his magazine. Uh, used to be four of us, four photographers would be crammed into this space, but now it's only two. Next. So, Moss Agate from Madhya Pradesh, India, from Indus Valley Commerce. Um, these are all shots I took at the St. Marie Show. Next. Copper from a fine, a recent fine just before the show from Bo Nahas Al Nif, Morocco. 2.9 centimeters across from Polish mineral dealers, uh, Sparifer. Next. Beautiful fluorides from the La Viesca mine in La Collada, Spain. This is also from Sparifer, 8.6 centimeters across. Next. Uh, superb tourmaline, Elbite tourmaline from the Pedernera mine in Brazil from Brice Gobain, French mineral dealer. 7.8 centimeters across. So that's a bit over three inches. Next. A beautiful fluorapatite with fluorite from the Panascara mines in Portugal, 9.3 centimeters across, from French mineral dealer Frederic Esco. Next. And uh, they'd gotten some amazing Vivianites out not long before the show from the Huanuni mine in Bolivia. And uh, this is 12 centimeters across from Unique Minerals, which is Evan Jones, our local boy. Next. Uh, Shafi, Shafi Muhammad is a mineral dealer from uh, Peshawar, Pakistan, uh, dealing primarily with minerals of northern Pakistan, the, the, the pigmatites up there. This is a spodumene by kunzite from Moai, Lagman province, Afghanistan. So this is just kind of across the border, 9.8 centimeters high. Next. I get home and I did some photography for, believe it or not, a jeweler by the name of Kit Carson, who lives in New River. Arizona. This is a brooch made with opal, moonstone, silver, and gold. Next. Um, beautiful pair of uh, dioptase crystals, a little thumbnail, 2.4 centimeters across from the Bill Severance collection. And this is from Sumeb, Namibia. Uh, next. And this one here, I think what this is at we are in August now. I am now, uh, I usually don't get back from Europe until the middle of July. And I've got two weeks at home to maybe recover, catch my breath, do a little processing, then head off again. I drive back east to the Springfield, Massachusetts show. So that's where these shots were taken. This was a find, a new find at the time of amethyst from the from Withy Hill in Moosup, Wyndham County, uh, Connecticut. 2.3 centimeters high from Jason Baskin, a New Jersey dealer collector. Next. Um, I headed north after the show, and there's a wonderful new museum called the Main. Uh, oh, excuse me. This is this is a different one. I spent a day or two photographing at the Main State Museum. And uh, <clears throat> this is a carving made out of colored tourmaline, all from Newry, Maine, the Dunton Mine. 7.3 centimeters high, carved in Germany. Next. 
This is a tourmaline from the Dutton mine. This is the type of material the bird was carved out of, 7.7 .7 centimeters high. Next. And this is the main state tourmaline necklace. All of the stones in it are cut from main tourmalines, and the gold was panned out of gold, uh, out of streams in Maine. Uh, and all of the stones actually are from the Dunton mine. The total weight of all those stones is 54.74 carats. It is worn by the governor's wife on special occasions of state. Next. So from there I headed southwest and I was in uh, Maryland. And uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, Maryland. A <clears throat> collection of David Dinsmore. <clears throat> This is Amazonite Smoky Quartz from the Smoky Hawk Clan in, in Teller County, Colorado, 11.4 centimeters wide. Next. And a friend of his came by with a few rocks to shoot named George Koenig. This is Vanadenite from the Mibladen, uh, Mibladen Conifera, Morocco, 6.5 centimeters across. Next. Um, in Delaware, there's a collector by the name of Ed Strickler. He has a particular fondness for azurite. This is an azurite from Morenci, Greenlee County, Arizona. 2.3 centimeters high in the crystal. Next. Um, from there, I think I headed north again. And uh, up in Beacon, New York, is a dealership by the name of Green Mountain Minerals. And the uh, owner is Dylan Stolowitz. Does a lot of uh, shows around the country. Uh, also very high in minerals. This is elbite tourmaline with lipidolite from the Petunera mine, eight centimeters high. Next. Um, well, I headed southwest from there to a little town called Lebanon, not Lebanon, but Lebanon, Tennessee. And that's a little ways northeast of Nashville. Anyway, Steve Neely, who is a very fine uh, mineral collector and orthopedic surgeon, has a... Uh, Super collection there. This is fluorite from Rimbos Mach in North Cape Province, South Africa. 11.3 centimeters high. Probably the largest crystal I've seen from this particular find. Next. Back at home, good old Phoenix in uh, early September. I did some photography for B Barker and Company. They are gemstone importers and cutters in Scottsdale. These are all elbaite tourmalines, rubellites from Nigeria. The total weight of all those stones is 98.19 carats. And uh, the way they're set up, obviously, they can be made into a, a necklace of graded stones, a pair of matched earrings, and one stone for a big cocktail ring. Next. Anyway, on to the Denver show. I go do the Denver show, which is the uh, usually the second weekend of September every year. And uh, this is Crocoite from the Red Lead Mine in Dundas, Tasmania, Australia. 9.3 centimeters high from the Keith and Mana Proctor collection. Next. So while I was there, Jeffrey Morrison brought some more of the tourmalines that he was mining and having cut from Maine at the Havy Mine. And uh, the largest stone there in the top center is 10.64 carats. Next. Um, Spurfer, again from uh, Warsaw, Poland. They brought me this piece here. Interestingly enough, from Poland, we've got a, they've got to bring us back from Azurite Malachite from Marenci, Arizona. 3.8 centimeters high. Next. This is a calcite, a cobalt bearing from the Agudal mine in Boazer, Morocco. The largest crystal there is 1.4 centimeters, so a little over half an inch. Also sparifer. Next. Uh, David Herskowitz uh, works with a number of the big auction houses such as Bonham. And uh, this is a beautiful labradorite, uh, eight inches high from Madagascar, that was going into uh, one of the bottoms, bottoms, um, um, yeah, auctions. Next, fellow up there by the name of Mark Zorinsky deals in used medical equipment, but he really got into using a computer guided um, machine, and he can program it to do amazing things. So he takes big slabs of aluminum and uh, carves them. In this case here, it's kind of a psychedelic ammonite. And it's uh, the largest dimension is 30.8 30 centimeters high. So that's a foot high. Next. 
Anyway, afterwards, I went up in the mountains to a little town called, um, what's it called? Anyway, up in the mountains just west of, uh, um, um, yeah, Denver, where Marty Zinn lives. Now, Marty is the one who, he's a show promoter. He was, he's retired now, but he ran several shows around the country. And he's a very fine mineral collector. This is silver with calcite from Kongsberg, Norway, 9.2 centimeters across. And this is... Uh, He's been distributing the collection, or at least portions of it, to his three children, uh, his daughter Jenny Zinn in this particular case. Next. Uh, the Collector's Edge, uh, as already mentioned, has very, very high-end minerals. This is uh, from a find of superb euclases with albite and the pink fluorapatite there from the La Marina mine in Boyacá, Colombia, 3.6 centimeters high. Uh, sometimes I go to their place and spend a day or two shooting for them after or before the Denver show. Next. Um, I think I came down back to Connecticut, I mean, right back, Connecticut, back to Arizona and down to Tucson. This is gypsum, again, a ram's horn habit from the West Camp in Santa Eulalia, Chihuahua, Mexico, from the collection of Peter McGaw, 10 centimeters high. Peter is a ge mining geologist. And he specializes in the minerals of only Mexico. Has probably the finest Mexican mineral collection in the world. Next. Another piece of his. These are the famous Wolfenreiths from the uh, Sierra de los Lamentos in Chihuahua. 8.7 centimeters high. Next. And uh, Brochantite. Uh, we're going back to that Milpias mine I told you about before. They produce amazing azurites. Um, super Brochantite. 6.3 centimeters across. This is in the Marshall Sussman collection. He also lives in Tucson, a very high-end collection. Uh, and I spent a day or so photographing for him after Peter McGaw. Next. Uh, let me see. I got back from Tucson, did some photography with a whole bunch of cabochons that were sent to me from Rare Earth a dealership in um, primarily in jewels and gems in Connecticut. This is rutilated quartz from Brazil. And it's 39 millimeters or 3.9 centimeters longest dimension. Next. End of October is the second biggest mineral show in the world in Munich, Germany. So <clears throat> I head off to Germany almost every year uh, in October. And uh, they do a phenomenal, phenomenal show. And uh, the theme this year was precious stones. It's about Edelsteine translates as. And uh, next, I set up here and do photography for several days. This is the special exhibit section. Tucson could learn a thing or two from the way uh, this show is run. Anyway, next. So you go inside and there are these beautiful cases. Each one of those wall-mounted cases has a superb natural crystal in it with an amazing cut stone of the same species. In this case here, you can see uh, uh, smaragd is German for emerald, aquamarine, and uh, beryl. Of course, they're all beryl. Next. Here's an example of on the left is probably the finest emerald matrix specimen ever to come out of North Carolina. The piece on the right is from uh, Boyacá, Colombia, and a large faceted emerald in the right foreground. Next. Then uh, in the courtyard areas between the between the exhibit halls, of which there are four or five halls, size of airplane hangers, uh, commercial airplane hangers, and they have all kinds of amazing exhibits. Here we have some cavemen uh, attacking a <clears throat> a mastodon that evidently is sunk into the grass or a tar pit or something, and uh, they often have dinosaur large models of dinosaurs. Uh, you name it, it's a killer show to go to. Next. And if you like beer, well, this is the place to go. They always have a co-theme besides the minerals. They have a theme of fossils. In this case here, it was fossils of the famous Zollenhofen locality in Germany that produced the, uh, all of the, uh, the uh, known Archaeopteryx fossils and uh, superb plant and fish fossils such as you see here. Next. There was also a special exhibit on the minerals of uh, the Trentino Alps in Italy. Next. 
And uh, of course, I'm taking pictures while I'm there. I'm not just schmoozing and uh, drinking beer. Uh, this is a fantastic Tanzanite that was brought for that special display. The thing is 14.7.3 centimeters high, so that's not quite six inches. And this is from Hong Kong collector Sam Yong's collection. Next. Uh, amazing rhodochrosite I shot for Brice Gauvin from the Antwaning Mines in South Africa, 13 centimeters across. Next. Uh, Will Larson, that's Bill Larson's son, he was there with his father, of course, and he bought this superb smoky quartz from the famous La Rufibach pocket from Zingenstock in Switzerland. It's 11.5 uh, centimeters high. Next. Uh, after the show was over, I went uh, a little ways. Uh, probably some of you heard of a town called Idar Oberstein. Uh, it's actually two towns, Idar and Oberstein. And this is the gem cuttings and uh, jewelry, at least the gem center of Europe, if not the world. Uh, anyway, this is a beautiful ruby I photographed for uh, cutter importer uh, Eckhart Schneider, who actually lives just outside of Idar Oberstein, 7.99 carats. And by the way, you do under, hear the way I pronounced it. It's either Oberstein. It's not Oberstein. That's an American corruption of a German uh, German name. Same with Rubenstein or uh, any of those names. But anyway, we're Americans. We can pronounce things the way we want to. Next. Elbaite. <clears throat> These are three different types of Elbaite tourmaline. Starting on the left, we have Vertilite. Rubellite and indicolite. And uh, the largest, ah, that shouldn't be centimeters, that should be carats. Anyway, 7.8 carats, also from Eckhart Schneider. Next. A nice rough and cut tourmaline from Namibia, nine centimeter stone, uh, crystal, and 32.37 carat stone. Next. Um, more Elbite tourmaline from Nigeria. Also Schneider Collection, 6.6 .6 centimeters high, and the one uh, lying down is 5.8 centimeters long. Next. I do enjoy doing rough and cut shots such as this. Also from Nigeria, we get some amazing Spessartine garnets. Those are natural uncut crystals behind, obviously rather small, but the large stones are exquisite. They call them Mandarin garnets. And... Uh, the uh, largest of the two stones is 22.17 carats. Next. Um, in Ederoberstein, or near Ederoberstein, is uh, a carver, uh, a family of carvers. And uh, the father, who has now passed away about three years ago, named Gert Dreher, um, does these amazing carvings of animals in agate and other precious and semi-precious stones. And uh, they are lifelike. They're just exquisite. And just for the record, starting in April at the Houston Museum of Natural Science, they're going to have an exhibit of his work of, um, from the museum's collection, as well as the Dreyer family collection and two collections in London. If you can get down to Houston's, I don't know the exact opening date, but sometime in, after uh, late April and going on, your minds will be boggled by the incredible quality of the carvings of this fellow. Anyway, this is carved by Garrett Dreyer. Uh, his son, Patrick, now carries on the tradition, and he is actually the fifth generation to do this. Great, great grandpa was carving for Fabergé and the Czars back at the turn of the century. Anyway, this is 12.3 uh, centimeters wide and in the Eckhart Schneider collection. Next. Um, strangely enough, what, normally when you go to the Munich show, it's not the best time of year to be in Germany. It's cold, it's cloudy, it's rainy, it's kind of icky weather. It's not a good time for touristing. Well, we happened to have some beautiful days when I was at the Schneider's place, and we went out to a little place that they own in the mountains outside of town, and we had ourselves next a uh, nice little barbecue. There's Eckhart with one of his boys. <clears throat> Actually, it's his only boy. He's got one daughter and one son. Anyway, this is the way they grill in Germany. Uh, the neat thing about that hanging uh, grill there is it spins around and you can move it out from on top of the fire. It's pretty cool. Next. Well, back at home, uh, I was doing some shooting for a few years for Adam Neely Fine Jewelry with offices and showrooms in both Laguna Beach and San Francisco. So this is a pair of earrings of topaz, blue topaz, 
diamonds and gold that I did for them once I got home. Next. Uh, I went up to Montana and I was shooting. This is all super secret, private, and uh, can't say who I was shooting for anyway. But this was a beautiful emerald necklace from the late 1800s with set with diamonds and platinum. And uh, an amazing piece of jewelry from uh, royal Euro European royalty. I'm not even going to say what country. Next. Um, let me see. I'm sorry. There's a collector in um, right here in Arizona by the name of Steve Maslansky. And um, uh, yeah, senior moment here as to where he lives. North of here. Anyway, floor, this is fluorite with quartz from the Huanggang mines in Inner Mongolia, China, 6.6 .6 centimeters wide. I sometimes go up to his place and uh, photograph for him, which I did. This has got to be somewhere in uh, November now after I got back from the Munich show. Next. And uh, back at my place, uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Dodge, who lives in Glendale, uh, has been collecting in a place called Glass Butte up in Oregon. And this is not Sheen Obsidian. It's not, uh, it's a very bizarre special locality that only, uh, only place in the world that produces this, what he calls fire obsidian. And uh, anyway, it's 27 by 32 millimeters. He collects this stuff, he cuts it and polishes it. And it's amazing. And it's very difficult to photograph. Next. Um, Irv Brown, I mentioned before, this is a piece from his collection. It's Adamite from the Ojuela mine in Durango, Mexico, 4.8 centimeters high. I don't remember whether he brought this to me or I went down the back to Fallbrook or uh, uh, San Diego rather. Next. Yeah, I must have. So back to San Diego shooting for Irv. This is barrel variety Morganite with albite feldspar from the White Queen mine in Paula, California, 7.8 centimeters high. Next. And uh, also in San Diego, our collectors, Joe and Susan Cobasso. And uh, <clears throat> they're heavily into fluorite. And he's originally from the Midwest, so has a lot of very serious specimens from the Midwest. Whereas his wife, Susan, she's very heavily into Mexican minerals. So this is from all we know is Hardin County, Illinois, where all the fluorite mines are. 6.4 centimeters wide. Next. And uh, back to the Larsons. This is a rather strange... Rose quartz, sort of a mushroom, uh, with a little tourmaline on the side there from Araswai, Minas Gerais, Brazil, 4.8 centimeters high. Next. Don't get too antsy now. We're coming to the end. We're in November already. Um, you can have your bathroom break pretty soon. <coughs> anyway, wolfenite and mimetite. This is where I'm back at the Graber's house in Fallbrook. Um, this is from the San Francisco mine in Sonora, Mexico. 4.9 centimeters wide, an amazing, amazing miniature sized wolfenite specimen. Next. A um, little bit further north in, um, uh, I remember the town, northwest of uh, Los Angeles. And um, collector Conan Bark, Conan Barker lives there, and he generally likes big pieces, but this is one of the smaller ones I shot for him. This is gold from the De Maria mine in Placer County, California, 10.2 centimeters high. Next. Also from his collection, another one of those twins from uh, Cumbria, England. This one with a little hematite dusting on it, giving it that reddish uh, color and 10 centimeters wide. Next. <coughs> Matthew Webb is a collector down in Melbourne, or if you live down under, it's Melbourne, Australia. And uh, he has quite a collection. This is Amethyst from Magdalesburg in South Africa, 13 centimeters across. Uh, I did not go to his home on this particular trip to shoot. I went to Australia a couple years later to photograph for him and other collectors for another supplement on Australia. I believe this is one that he had in Arizona with some of his collection that was in storage. Uh, next. And I have to say that is the end of the slide program. We can 
open the doors, the gates, uh, whatever for uh, questions on whatever aspect of uh, the presentation you want to. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the YouTube uh, uh, chat box. Uh, I don't have any at except hellos right now. So hello, all everybody there. Jeff, that was amazing. Uh, the, the fantastic minerals, fantastic uh, photographs. Um, my own small efforts. I understand a little bit about what's going on in there. <laughs> I'm just trying to get decent. Um, I just checked uh, Houston Museum of Natural Science doesn't have upcoming exhibits up yet, mm -hmm. uh, but they did uh, about three and a half years ago have uh, Peter Dreyer uh, exhibit there. Patrick. So with Patrick, uh, with um, and there's some stuff up about it around the internet. There's a video with a couple of things. If you so if you look up Dreyer and and Houston Museum exhibit, you will come across that and be able to see some of that. Um, and I have a question. Sure. Uh, what is your preferred photo editing software? I use Photoshop. Um, it's the standard. <laughs> I figure if I'm going to be processing and picking other people's brains and trying to learn what the heck I'm doing, I better use something that most everybody uses. Mm -hmm. I've been pretty happy with it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> There is other, I use Photoshop does stacking too, but when I first tried using it, I actually used Photoshop stacking ability when I started doing stacking about six, seven years ago and found it was God awful. And so I switched to a dedicated software that that's all it does and it's called Helicon. But there are two other, uh, there's also Zreen and Combine Z on the, uh, on the market, but neither of which I've used. Okay, do you have any general tips on how to light that's not another talk. That's a whole semester course. <laughs> but, but that being said, I use primarily um, studio strobe equipment. And very few people do that because um, it's kind of expensive. And uh, it does take a little getting used to. But <clears throat> if you, <clears throat> a lot of people are, using, people are using LED lighting right now. Uh, I can't say it's the best in ways because even though it's adjustable in color temperature at this point, it still tends to be rather cool. And it's not going to be that good if you're going to be photographing anything like yellow, orange, or red. Uh, CFL lights, same thing. They're, they're cool. They're inexpensive. They're available. But uh, they tend to be very cool, and they're not adjustable in color temperature. And on top of that, not much. You can't you haven't got many options to control them. You haven't got fiber optics. You haven't got uh, spotlights. You haven't got, you know, different ways of controlling, focusing the light and all that. Um, <clears throat> probably the most usable, adjustable lights that you can get are going to be halogen lights, quartz halogens, because you can get them as floodlights and, uh, you know, uh, you can get soft boxes for them. You can do them as fiber optics. I mean, uh, everything. Uh, on the other hand, they're great for warm colored minerals, but not the greatest for cool colored minerals. So basically I, I found the best all the way around for um, color, the most accurate color temperature is gonna be uh, studio strobes, which are very close to daylight col in, in color temperature. Uh, you also said you, uh, pho uh, you, you light it through <clears throat> tissue paper as well, a diffuser? It's not really tissue paper. Okay. It? Quick, uh, something, something like that, but, but some, you, some sort of diffuser. Yeah, actually, what I do is uh, there's a, a cine, um, uh, you know, cinematographer store here in Phoenix. Um, name of which, of course, I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, they provide professional photo gear and uh, for anyone who's like filming professional movies here or if you're a professional still photographer. So there's a material made by Lee Filters. Lee is one of the big companies along with Roscoe that makes all sorts of colored gels and filters. And they sell a material that's called, it's a diffusion material. It just looks, it comes in a roll probably about six feet across. And 
fairly <clears throat> thin <clears throat> white material. And the nice thing about it is that it is designed to be extremely color neutral. Because I was before that, uh, before I started using that a uh, year or two back, I was using uh, arts of, uh, a material called vellum from an art supply store. And uh, nice material, very nice. But the problem is uh, it was making my backgrounds, giving them kind of a bluish tint, which wasn't good. It's also strange because most papers and diffusers are actually going to tend to make your, your uh, warm your, your photos, not make them cool. But anyway, once I discovered and started using this uh, this official real diffusing material, my backgrounds quit being quite so blue. Okay. Uh, the same person asked more about, about photography. We're just going to have to have you back. Um, how do you decide what color backgrounds and what type of camera and lens do you use? If you would like to know. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I don't do as many color backgrounds as I used to. And if you notice, for the most part, if it was a color, it was going to be blue. Um, back in the day, I used to use a lot more color backgrounds. And basically, I would choose something that was complementary. For instance, if you have a blue or a green specimen, you can go with, uh, with red. Um, on the other hand, I don't like using really strong primary red because it's just too garish for a photograph anyway. I never, ever ever use yellow or orange for a background. That's a big no-no. It's just, it's just kind of just gross and icky <laughs> to prefer it, put it professionally. Um, I try, if you notice the vast majority of pictures were taken with a neutral background with a neutral halo. And I find that will certainly go well with any mineral that you plan to shoot. Uh, it's not going to compete with it and um, clash. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a mineral that tends to be, that, that is black or white and has no color, if I shoot it with the neutral halo, well, that makes for a kind of a boring black and white picture. And then I will use generally a blue background and not too much else these days. Um, <clears throat> as far as choice of camera goes, uh, I started out years ago with Pentax because that's what my dad gave me. I'll use Pentax. But uh, once I started getting serious and professional, I uh, got rid of that and I bought some uh, professional Canons. Uh, their professional camera at the time, we're talking film, back a few years, was their, their F series, F1. And I had three of those and I used those for years. And when I went digital, I decided to switch to Nikon. I did not switch to Nikon because it was particularly better for any reason. It's because that's what was available at the camera store when I went there. And I asked, what have you got that's a decent camera, as far as the model goes, not the make, that is uh, decent but not are terribly expensive that I can learn on. And if I goof up, you know, or, or, or whatever, I haven't spent a lot of money on a camera that uh, uh, I may either be throwing out or trashing or whatever. But anyway, so I went to Nikon. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Nikon and Canon are both superb cameras. I wouldn't have minded one bit sticking with, with uh, Canon, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, no offense to you you out there, you car nuts, car buffs, but Canon and Nikon are like Ford and Chevy. They're very comparable. Neither one's particularly better. And you're going to be, uh, you're going to stick with and going to love the rest of your life is because it was your first car or your first camera. And you just never switched after that. But <clears throat> Nikon has a slight head in that they have a larger range of lenses available than Canon has. Canon uh, has a slight edge in that, and is damn small, is the quality of their optics might be a hair, a hair better than Nikon's. And I'm sure there's people who are going to beat me up for that or argue that point. But um, they're so similar. You know, it doesn't make a difference. What makes a difference is the lens you're using. I used primarily uh, two lenses, uh, two Nikon can, uh, macro lenses. One is a 60 millimeter and one's 105. It's a little strange that that focal length because most manufacturers make a 50 and 100 millimeter. Why Nikon went with those weird numbers, I have no idea. Doesn't make much difference. But the, the, <clears throat> the macro... <clears throat> 100 millimeter macro is what I use for smaller subjects because it gives me the same magnification as the 60, 
but with more working room. And when you start getting closer and closer to a subject, you want some working room. You don't want to get in your own way of, the, of your lights and, and, and anything else, lights, reflectors, whatever. So uh, larger pieces, I switch to the 60 millimeter lens. So what's important is get a good quality macro lens. They will let you get to the magnification you need with uh, high resolution. So, uh, and which, I couldn't tell you which is a great Nikon camera. Uh, I tell you, if you want to get the top of the line Nikon, uh, which is the D6 right now, <clears throat> it's a nearly $7,000 camera. It has more bells and whistles on it than you'll ever use. It's probably going to be a waste. Uh, I used to teach bird watching, and I would always say, get the best binoculars you can afford to break on the first day. There you go. Because <laughs> th then you'll go buy another pair of binoculars and keep at it as opposed to. Yeah. <laughs> or just learn well, until you get better. Um, I use a couple of D500s right now, which are pretty good cameras. They're, they're, they're um, 21 megapixels. And uh, the even the top of the line Nikon, uh, the D6, is 21 megapixels. But the big difference is it's a full size sensor, which the D500s are not. And on top of that, the D6 has got it. The D6 would be well worth the investment if you were seriously into wildlife or sports photography, because it's got a mo. You know, it's got a drive on it that I don't know how many frames per second. It's fast. It's got extra battery power, so it'll last much longer without having to change batteries. Uh, it, it's 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 got features on it that you're not going to use in the studio. So my couple of D500s, which are like you know, maybe $2,500 cameras are perfectly good. I've also got a D850 because uh, the Dreyer carvings. I had shot all the, all the shots. Remember the ones you were talking about that were on display at the Houston Museum three years ago. I spent six days in there photographing uh, every one of those 67 carvings from three different angles and stacked them all for a book catalog that's going to come out in time for this show that's coming up. Um, <clears throat> uh, fine, super high quality. The problem was that after, uh, well, the curator, the, the president of the museum actually decided that this book was not going to be done in standard four color press, but he was going to do a six color, which is also higher resolution. And the publisher wanted to take all the horizontal shots and be able to put them across two pages, in which case the 21 megapixel wasn't going to hold the resolution. So I went out and bought a 45 megapixel D850 camera just for this project. So reshot all the horizontal specimens or subjects so that they could be printed across you know, both pages. Uh, so, and I'm only going to use it for special occasions like that because the problem is the files are gigantic. The shots are gigantic. It takes much longer to process shots that, that big. I've gone from maybe 70 megabytes for a TIFF to about anywhere from 150 to 250 megs for a single TIFF. <laughs> so it's a specialty camera. Right. Uh, Yo Yo says, thank you very much. Loved your presentation. And he was the one, or they, excuse me, they, I'm not sure. They were the one that asked all the camera questions. And Brian says, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, and with that, I don't see any more questions coming in. And so I'm going to let you go and have a wonderful evening yourself. And thank you extremely much. And I'm always glad to share. And I, I hope maybe I've helped corrupt a few more people into continuing their hobby of mineral collecting and maybe trying to take pics of their rocks. Absolutely. And I, and I put your website in the comments. Someone to ask about that. And I good, put good. that in the comments. So it's there too. Um, I will also put it in the description of the video after we're done here. I just hadn't right. put that in yet. And I thank you very much. I want to remind our viewers that if you need to go, Jeff, go, go right ahead. I'm just going to remind our viewers that on March 12th, we have a big show, Meteorites and Dinosaurs, coming at the museum live 10 to 3 on Saturday, March 12th. And that then our next presentation will be here at, on March 16th speaker to be announced but i think it's going to be another really good one maybe not as good as jeff but we'll... <laughs>
Competition, competition keeps us on right. our toes. Right. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. That's all from here. I'm going to end the broadcast. Thanks, Mucho. It's been Thank a joy. You.